Chapter Seventeen of A Distinguished Provincial at Paris by Honore de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Seventeen. At two o'clock in the afternoon, Coralie and her lover were sitting together. The poet, to all appearance, had come to pay a call. Lucien had been bathed and combed and dressed. Coralie had sent du Colliot's for a dozen fine shirts, a dozen cravats, and a dozen pocket handkerchiefs for him, as well as twelve pairs of gloves in a cedar wood box. When a carriage stopped at the door, they both rushed to the window and watched Camusot alight from a handsome coupe. I would not have believed that one could so hate a man and luxury i am too poor to allow you to ruin yourself for me he replied and thus lucien passed under the caudine forks poor pet said coralie holding him tightly to her do you love me so much i persuaded this gentleman to call on me this morning she continued indicating lucien to camusot who entered the room i thought that we might take a drive in the champs elysees to try the carriage go without me said camusot in a melancholy voice i shall not dine with you it is my wife's birthday i had forgotten that poor musot how badly bored you will be she said putting her arms about his neck she was wild with joy at the thought that she and lucien would handsell this gift together she would drive with him in the new carriage and in her happiness she seemed to love camusot she lavished caresses upon him if only i could give you a carriage every day said the poor fellow now sir it is two o'clock she said turning to lucien who stood in distress and confusion but she comforted him with an adorable gesture down the stairs she went several steps at a time drawing lucien after her the elderly merchant following in their wake like a seal on land and quite unable to catch them up lucien enjoyed the most intoxicating of pleasures happiness had increased coralie's loveliness to the highest possible degree she appeared before all eyes an exquisite vision in her dainty toilette all paris in the champs elysees beheld the lovers in an avenue of the bois de boulogne they met a caleche madame d'espard and madame de bargeton looked in surprise at lucien and met a scornful glance from the poet he saw glimpses of a great future before him and was about to make his power felt he could fling them back in a glance some of the revengeful thoughts which had gnawed his heart ever since they planted them there that moment was one of the sweetest in his life and perhaps decided his fate once again the furies seized on lucien at the bidding of pride he would reappear in the world of paris he would take a signal revenge all the social pettiness hitherto trodden under foot by the worker the member of the brotherhood sprang up again afresh in his soul now he understood all that lousteau's attack had meant lousteau had served his passions while the brotherhood that collective mentor had seemed to mortify them in the interests of tiresome virtues and work which began to look useless and hopeless in lucien's eyes work what is it but death to an eager pleasure-loving nature and how easy it is for the man of letters to slide into a far niente existence of self-indulgence into the luxurious ways of actresses and women of easy virtues lucien felt an overmastering desire to continue the reckless life of the last two days the dinner at the rocher de cancale was exquisite all florine's supper guests were there except the minister the duke and the dancer camusot too was absent but these gaps were filled by two famous actors and hector merlin and his mistress this charming woman who chose to be known as madame du val noble was the handsomest and most fashionable of the class of women now euphemistically styled lorettes lucien had spent the forty-eight hours since the success of his article in paradise 
he was feted and envied he gained self-possession his talk sparkled he was the brilliant lucien de rubempre who shone for a few months in the world of letters and art finot with his infallible instinct for discovering ability scenting it afar as an ogre might scent human flesh cajoled lucien and did his best to secure a recruit for the squadron under his command and coralie watched the manoeuvres of this purveyor of brains saw that lucien was nibbling at the bait and tried to put him on his guard don't make any engagement dear boy wait they want to exploit you we will talk of it to-night pshaw said lucien i am sure i am quite as sharp and shrewd as they can be finot and hector merlin evidently had not fallen out over that affair of the white lines and spaces in the columns for it was finot who introduced lucien to the journalist coralie and madame du val-noble were overwhelmingly amiable and polite to each other and madame du val-noble asked lucien and coralie to dine with her hector merlin short and thin with lips always tightly compressed was the most dangerous journalist present unbounded ambition and jealousy smouldered within him he took pleasure in the pain of others and fomented strife to turn it to his own account his abilities were but slender and he had little force of character but the natural instinct which draws the upstart towards money and power served him as well as fixity of purpose lucien and merlin at once took a dislike to each other for reasons not far to seek merlin unfortunately proclaimed aloud the thoughts that lucien kept to himself by the time the dessert was put on the table the most touching friendship appeared to prevail among the men each one of whom in his heart thought himself a cleverer fellow than the rest and lucien as the newcomer was made much of by them all they chatted frankly and unrestrainedly hector merlin alone did not join in the laughter lucien asked the reason of his reserve you are just entering the world of letters i can see he said you are a journalist with all your illusions left you believe in friendship here we are friends or foes as it happens we strike down a friend with the weapon which by rights should only be turned against an enemy you will find out before very long that fine sentiments will do nothing for you if you are naturally kindly learn to be ill-natured to be consistently spiteful if you have never heard this golden rule before i give it you now in confidence and it is no small secret if you have a mind to be loved never leave your mistress until you have made her shed a tear or two and if you mean to make your way in literature let other people continually feel your teeth make no exception even of your friends wound their susceptibilities and everybody will fawn upon you hector merlin watched lucien as he spoke saw that his words went to the neophyte's heart like a stab and hector merlin was glad play followed lucien lost all his money and coralie brought him away and he forgot for a while in the delights of love the fierce excitement of the gambler which was to gain so strong a hold upon him when he left coralie in the morning and returned to the latin quarter he took out his purse and found the money he had lost at first he felt miserable over the discovery and thought of going back at once to return a gift which humiliated him but he had already come as far as the rue de la harpe he would not return now that he had almost reached the hotel de cluny he pondered over coralie's forethought as he went till he saw in it a proof of the maternal love which is blended with passion in women of her stamp for coralie and her like passion includes every human affection lucien went from thought to thought and argued himself into accepting the gift i love her he said we shall live together as husband and wife i will never forsake her 
what mortal short of a diogenes could fail to understand lucien's feelings as he climbed the dirty fetid staircase to his lodging turned the key that grated in the lock and entered and looked round at the unswept brick floor at the cheerless grate at the ugly poverty and bareness of the room a package of manuscript was lying on the table it was his novel a note from daniel d'arthez lay beside it our friends are almost satisfied with your work dear poet d'arthez wrote you will be able to present it with more confidence now they say to friends and enemies we saw your charming article on the panorama dramatique you are sure to excite as much jealousy in the profession as regret among your friends here daniel regrets what does he mean exclaimed lucien the polite tone of the note astonished him was he to be henceforth a stranger to the brotherhood he had learned to set a higher value on the good opinion and the friendship of the circle in the rue des quatre vents since he had tasted of the delicious fruits offered to him by the eve of the theatrical underworld for some moments he stood in deep thought he saw his present in the garret and foresaw his future in coralie's rooms honorable resolution struggled with temptation and swayed him now this way now that he sat down and began to look through his manuscript to see in what condition his friends had returned it to him what was his amazement as he read chapter after chapter to find his poverty transmuted into riches by the cunning of the pen and the devotion of the unknown great men his friends of the brotherhood dialogue closely packed nervous pregnant terse and full of the spirit of the age replaced his conversations which seemed poor and pointless prattle in comparison his characters a little uncertain in the drawing now stood out in vigorous contrast of color and relief physiological observations due no doubt to horace bianchon supplied links of interpretations between human character and the curious phenomena of human life subtle touches which made his men and women live his wordy passages of description were condensed and vivid the misshapen ill-clad child of his brain had returned to him as a lovely maiden with white robes and rosy-hued girdle and scarf an entrancing creation night fell and took him by surprise reading through rising tears stricken to earth by such greatness of soul feeling the worth of such a lesson admiring the alterations which taught him more of literature and art than all his four years apprenticeship of study and reading and comparison a master's correction of a line made upon the study always teaches more than all the theories and criticisms in the world what friends are these what hearts how fortunate i am he cried grasping his manuscript tightly with the quick impulsiveness of a poetic and mobile temperament he rushed off to daniel's lodging as he climbed the stairs and thought of these friends who refused to leave the path of honor he felt conscious that he was less worthy of them than before a voice spoke within him telling him that if d'arthez had loved coralie he would have had her break with camusot and besides this he knew that the brotherhood held journalism in utter abhorrence and that he himself was already to some small extent a journalist all of them except meyrot who had just gone out were in d'arthez's room when he entered it and saw that all their faces were full of sorrow and despair what is it he cried we have just heard news of a dreadful catastrophe the greatest thinker of the age our most loved friend who was like a light among us for two years louis lambert has fallen a victim to catalepsy there is no hope for him said bianchon he will die his soul wandering in the skies his body unconscious on earth said michel Christian solemnly he will die as he lived said d'arthez 
love fell like a firebrand in the vast empire of his brain and burned him away said leon jouot yes said joseph bridau he has reached a height that we cannot so much as see we are to be pitied not louis said fulgence ridal perhaps he will recover exclaimed lucien from what Meyraux has been telling us recovery seems impossible answered bianchon medicine has no power over the change that is working in his brain yet there are physical means said d'arthez yes said bianchon we might produce imbecility instead of catalepsy is there no way of offering another head to the spirit of evil i would give mine to save him cried michel Chrestien. and what would become of european federation asked d'arthez ah true replied michel Chrestien. our duty to humanity comes first to one man afterwards i came here with a heart full of gratitude to you all said lucien you have changed my alloy into golden coin gratitude for what do you take us asked bianchon we had the pleasure added fulgence well so you are a journalist are you asked leon jouot the fame of your first appearance has reached even the latin quarter i am not a journalist yet returned lucien ah so much the better said michel Chrestien. i told you so said d'arthez lucien knows the value of a clean conscience when you can say to yourself as you lay your head on the pillow at night i have not sat in judgment on another man's work i have given pain to no one i have not used the edge of my wit to deal a stab to some harmless soul i have sacrificed no one's success to a jest i have not even troubled the happiness of imbecility i have not added to the burdens of genius i have scorned the easy triumphs of epigram in short i have not acted against my convictions is not this a viaticum that gives one daily strength but one can say all this surely and yet work on a newspaper said lucien if i had absolutely no other way of earning a living i should certainly come to this oh 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 cried fulgence his voice rising a note each time we are capitulating are we he will turn journalist leon giraud said gravely oh lucien if you would only stay and work with us we are about to bring out a periodical in which justice and truth shall never be violated we will spread doctrines that perhaps will be of real service to mankind you will not have a single subscriber lucien broke in with machiavellian wisdom there will be five hundred of them asserted michel Chrestien, but they will be worth five hundred thousand you will need a lot of capital continued lucien no only devotion said d'arthez anybody might take him for a perfumer's assistant burst out michel Chrestien, looking at lucien's head and sniffing comically you were seen driving about in a very smart turnout with a pair of thoroughbreds and a mistress for a prince coralie herself well and is there any harm in it you would not say that if you thought that there was no harm in it said bianchon i could have wished lucien a beatrice said d'arthez a noble woman who would have been a help to him in life but danielle asked lucien love is love wherever you find it is it not ah said the republican member on that one point i am an aristocrat i could not bring myself to love a woman who must rub shoulders with all sorts of people in the green room whom an actor kisses on stage she must lower herself before the public smile on every one lift her skirts as she dances and dress like a man that all the world may see what none should see save i alone or if i loved such a woman she should leave the stage and my love should cleanse her from the stain of it and if she would not leave the stage i should die of mortification jealousy and all sorts of pain 
you cannot pluck love out of your heart as you draw a tooth lucien's face grew dark and thoughtful when they find out that i am tolerating camusot how they will despise me he thought look here said the fierce republican with humorous fierceness you can be a great writer but a little play-actor you shall never be and he took up his hat and went out he is hard as michel christian commented lucien hard and salutary like the dentist's pincers said bianchon michel foresees your future perhaps in the street at this moment he is thinking of you with tears in his eyes d'arthez was kind and talked comfortingly and tried to cheer lucien the poet spent an hour with his friends then he went but his conscience treated him hardly crying to him you will be a journalist a journalist as the witch cried to macbeth that he should be king hereafter out in the street he looked up at d'arthez's windows and saw a faint light shining in them and his heart sank a dim foreboding told him that he had bidden his friends good-bye for the last time as he turned out of the place de la sorbonne into the rue de cluny he saw a carriage at the door of his lodging coralie had driven all the way from the boulevard du temple for the sake of a moment with her lover and a good night lucien found her sobbing in his garret she would be as wretchedly poor as her poet she wept as she arranged his shirts and gloves and handkerchiefs in the crazy chest of drawers her distress was so real and so great that lucien but even now chidden for his connection with an actress saw coralie as a saint ready to assume the hair shirt of poverty the adorable girl's excuse for her visit was an announcement that the firm of camusot coralie and lucien meant to invite matifat florine and lousteau the second trio to supper had lucien any invitations to issue to people who might be useful to him lucien said that he would take counsel of lousteau a few moments were spent together and coralie hurried away she spared lucien the knowledge that camusot was waiting for her below End of chapter seventeen